ladies and gentlemen, can I have your attention, please? Ladies and gentlemen, everyone, can I have your attention, please? I hope you have all enjoyed your dinner. But of course, it's not just food this evening. Um, so first of all, I'm Monique Tromp. Uh, for the people who don't know me, I'm Professor of Materials Chemistry at the Zernik Institute uh, of Advanced Materials of the University of Groningen. I'm not standing here uh, in that position. I'm standing here as part of the NWO Science Board to uh, open this NWO award session. Uh, I will say a bit more about the NWA awards later, but first we have an intermezzo, and it's not a non-important intermezzo, it's a very important intermezzo, but it doesn't have anything to do with NWO directly. Uh, but it's a very important prize, which will be announced here tonight, and for that I will give the floor to Petra Rudolf and Theo Rasing. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. In this very moment, I'm standing in front of you as the president of the European Physical Society. As most of you probably know, the European Physical Society unites 42 member societies, so it's much bigger than just the EU, and it is organized in divisions and groups which represent the various specialties in physics. And these divisions and groups also give prizes. And then the society as a whole gives prizes. And one of these prizes is the Emmy Noethe distinction, which distinguishes a female physicist in Europe every year. And it is run twice per year, once for a junior scientist and once for a senior scientist. And the senior scientist can decide when she would like to receive the prize. And the winner of this year has decided that she would like to receive it here. And so I'm very happy to be here and deliver it to her. But before I do that, I would like to ask Christiane de Moray Smith to come up to the podium. <laughs> and I shall give the word to Theo Rasing to tell you why she got this distinction. And just before I do that, I would like to invite all of you to check the prizes that are available from the European Physical Society and to nominate candidates. So, Theo, please. Mm. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> I see we are color coordinated, at least with my glasses. <laughs> Christian de Marijsweth has been awarded the Emmy Neuter Distinction of the European Physical Society for her outstanding scientific contributions to the theory of condensed matter, physics, in particular to the understanding of topological phases in 2D atomic and electronic systems, where she made seminal contributions to the understanding and design of quantum simulators in ultra-cold atoms and electronic systems. She's born in Brazil where she started her physics, but actually she's a true European. She did her PhD in Zurich, visiting scientist at uh, ICTP Trieste, postdoc in Hamburg, and then in Fribourg, Switzerland, where she became associate professor. And since 2004, she holds a pro full professorship in condensed matter physics at Utrecht University. Well, apart from her excellent contributions to science, Christian Moraes Smith is also a passionate teacher who attracts many students to her group by her enthusiasm and passion for science. She's also very engaged in outreach activities, combining science and art, participating in movies where she conveys her enthusiasm and passion 
for science in a contagious manner. She is therefore a role model for all her colleagues, especially for the few young female researchers who represent, unfortunately, less than 50% in our field in Europe. Therefore, the 2019 Emmy Nutter Distinction is therefore a well-deserved highlight in her brilliant career. very much. It is a very special moment for me and I am extremely pleased to share it with all of you in Veldhoven, which is like our second home. I, am, I cherish this prize very much because of the name that it carries. Eminuta, for the ones who don't know, this was a mathematician who lived in the beginning of last century, but her genealogy transcended her own discipline and she has made extremely important contributions in physics. She was the first person who realized that symmetries are connected to conserved quantities, and she proposed the invariance. So nowadays, when we get a new material like topological insulators, and we don't know much about them, the first thing we find are the symmetries, and which are the topological invariants associated to them. This is thanks to Eminenta. But the amazing thing is, despite all her gen geniality, she worked all her life, she was teaching, supervising students, and she never got any position. She never got assent, because she was a woman. And the most beautiful about her, she had no resentment. She went through all the injustice, smiling. And that's how one should do in life. Enjoy the beauty of science, the beauty of creating everything. Understand, times are changing slowly, but continuously. And today, although she was never a professor, we are here celebrating her. And I'm very happy to be part of it. Thank you. So now we will continue with the NWO award session. Uh, and, and the, the reason, reason I'm standing here before the actual awards is that this is the last year we will hand out the awards as they are. So in physics, we have the NWO thesis award, the NWO valorization award, the Minerva prize. But of course, NWO is not organized according to the disciplines anymore. We have the NWO science domain. So in line with the strategy and mission as defined by the science domain, we will also have domain-wide prizes. And this prize, um, these prizes are now under, under detail. And there will be, I think it will be on the screen, it is on the screen. Uh, so the details are being worked out as we speak, but we will have prizes in four categories. So there will be team science awards, there will be communication awards, awards in the field of diversity, and as you can see, the uh, awards in the field of impact. So we have had quite a few questions already that since we're a science domain, it will be multidisciplinary, multicultural to get any of these awards. No, of course not. So we will have several of these awards, and they might fall within physics, they might fall within chemistry, so we will see where they are. 
uh, and then they will be handed out on the appropriate conference. Um, so we won't have all the prizes every year here in Veldhoven, probably, uh, but maybe we do. So it depends on how well we do in the, the, the main event. Um, so these prizes and the details will be announced soon, I think in the next month. Um, and if you want more details, you can also go to the NWA stand where they can provide a little bit more detail. So at this stage, I will hand over to Gideon Kukuk, who will organize and coordinate the next NWO award session. Thanks. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Monique. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, indeed, my name is Gideon Kukuk. I'm an assistant professor at Maastricht University, where I work for 50% of my time on gravitational wave physics and my other 50% in education and outreach. Um, of course, I'm not standing here in that capacity. I'm standing here as a representative of the Program Organization Committee, and on behalf of myself and the rest of the committee, I would very much hope that you have been enjoying the program so far, will enjoy tomorrow, and also will enjoy the rest of the evening, because we have a very special evening lined up. As Monique has already said, this is the last time that some of these prizes are going to be awarded, so that by itself makes it special, but there's also something else going on. Aside from the very beautiful physics that was done in the last year and that was awarded the Minerva Prize and the Thies Award, Valorization Award, there's also another very prestigious prize that was handed out to a physicist last year, and we decided we should not let the opportunity pass to put that person in the spotlight as well. Um, for the people who already know who I'm talking about, it's of course Professor Ronald Hanson, who did work in applications of quantum mechanics for quantum uh, technology, computing, and maybe even a quantum internet. So can we have a warm round of applause for Professor Hanson? And can I invite him on stage, please? Yes. Yes. Um, now, uh, Professor Hansen, uh, your work, Ronald, your work has been uh, very, very interesting for many of us, um, including other people who would really like to know at what point can we expect a quantum computer that we can actually work with in our own researches. For instance, I'm not biased, but might be the Einstein telescope, for instance. The machine is 15 years away, so can you make it until then? Well, let me say this. I think you can already order one if you want. Just, just, just go to me and order one and do a prepayment and I will get you one in time. Okay. Um, just for 2,000 other people, how much will that cost about? How much will that cost? Um, when do you want it? That's the question. Eh? Uh, Einstein telescope is projected in 15 years from now, so... No, that's, that's, it actually does cost a lot of money and it, it ties it. Maybe I, Maybe you don't want this, but I'm going to say something serious now. Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's a big effort building a quantum computer, building quantum networks, etc. Um, and actually, last fall, we've completed with a lot of players in the Netherlands a national agenda to, uh, to make the Netherlands great again in uh, quantum technology, so to say. Um, and actually, this agenda is now on the table to, to be funded, hopefully. Uh, I think we have a very strong case uh, to, yeah, to, to do this in the Netherlands. Um, but, you know, it does cost money, of course, and, yes. and we, we hope funding comes through and we have the right people and the right attitude to make this happen. Yes. yes. And, of course, all joking aside, everybody is very much looking forward to your uh, next uh, discoveries. Now, in order to help you a little bit with that, uh, we have a gift that is connected. And it's my understanding that you are under strict conditions not to open up the gift just yet. Is that correct? That's, that's correct. Okay. Um, now, we did some research on how do you get your ideas, and when we delved in, we actually found that you get your ideas not, well, probably also by very intense uh, hard labor, but also in a very different way, namely via relaxation. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct, yes. That is correct, and I think we even have a, a snippet of video uh, where you explain this yourself. Ik krijg vaak de beste inzichten als ik ontspannen ben, bijvoorbeeld onder de douche of tijdens hardlopen. Well, <laughs> it was indeed a very short uh, snippet, but it's all the information that we need to know. Because um, if we very much look forward to your next discoveries, maybe the gift will help you along with getting some new ideas. So maybe now is a good time to open up. Yes, please.
Okay, you hold it up so everybody can see. <laughs> it's shower gel that actually says relaxation. So if there's one thing that will help Professor uh, Hansen get to his next beautiful results after running and after the shower, it will be shower gel that says realization. Thank you very much. <laughs> An applause for everybody. Yes. Yes. Um, we will now continue with the uh, more traditional part of the program, and that is that we're going to hand out these beautiful three prizes that we have on this table behind me. Um, the first of these is the Minerva uh, Prize for the best publication in physics by a female uh, scientist. Um, and I think the best way to introduce this prestigious winner is again by a video. In our research, we investigated how living tissues acquire their mechanical properties because in certain diseases, uh, these properties are altered. My name is Federica Burla, and I just finished my PhD in the group of biological soft matter at Amul. Tissues have uh, very fascinating mechanical properties because they can switch from being soft at small deformation to being rigid at larger deformation, a bit like what happens when you're pulling on an orange net. We investigated the interplay between collagen and hyaluronic acid because they're the most uh, present components in tissues and we find that by altering the ratio we can really strongly affect the mechanical properties. By understanding the interplay of these two components then we can also understand better what happens in situations when their balance is altered, for example during diseases. This work actually resulted from uh, very nice collaborations uh, and I am very thankful for, to my collaborators for making such a nice job together. And uh, actually I was very surprised when I learned about getting the prize. Can I please invite on stage Federica Bula? An applause. Hi, thanks. I, as I said in the video, I was indeed very surprised when I first got the call for um, the award. I was uh, in the last uh, weeks of my PhD and I was writing and then I got the call and then for a couple of moments I thought, okay, maybe this is a prank uh, call. So, okay, it took uh, a bit to sink in and then I called my supervisor and she actually confirmed and then, okay. <laughs> Um, but I would like to thank the organizers because I'm extremely honored and happy for getting this prize. Uh, it's an award for women in science and uh, during these years I've had the pleasure to work with a lot of women. Uh, first of all, my supervisor, Heishe Kundering, who for me is really an example of a woman scientist or a scientist in general should be, but also many friends and colleagues. And uh, as I said in the video, um, this work is, um, uh, resulted from a very close collaboration with the group of Jasper, who is uh, sitting over there, from uh, the University of Wageningen. And I think that you know, I would not be there without that. And uh, uh, it was uh, such a, an enriching experience for me, both from a, a personal and scientific point of view, to learn things from people with a different background and different ideas. So I think that this uh, sharing of ideas in science is really powerful and uh, I hope there will be more and more of that. And uh, thank to uh, every one of you for yeah, sharing this moment now. And with that we move on to the uh, next prize winner, uh, which is for the NWO Thesis Award, which this year has been given to Hugo Doeleman. Can I invite him on stage, please? <laughs> and again, there is a video where Hugo himself explains where he got the prize for.
So we took two structures that both trap light. One traps light for a very long time, and another one concentrates light very well. And we stuck them together and asked, can they be better than the individual constituents? And as it turned out from the calculation, we showed they can be better. And then we actually went into the lab, made them and proved experimentally that they indeed perform very well. My name is Hugo Doeleman. I did my PhD research at the Amhof Institute in collaboration with the University of Amsterdam. Well, what's very special for me was the collaboration I had with other researchers, other physicists, chemists, electrical engineers, and it's thanks to them that uh, we were able to use such a variety of new techniques to study the structures that we did. So we showed that this is a great building block to trap light. So I hope that other researchers will take this and use it in their research, for example, as part of a better sensor or of a quantum computer. I was very surprised and honored because uh, I know several of the previous winners. I even worked with them. Uh, and I always admire them very much. So to be one of them now is a great honor. Thank you very much, Gideon. Um, physics can seem rigid sometimes. These are the laws of nature. Deal with it. Yet if you study it for a while, the consequences of these laws are not at all straightforward. Speaking as a photonics man, knowing Maxwell's equation doesn't mean you know how to trap light or how to cloak an object. So physics is like life itself, in a way. People aren't just good or bad, and big decisions are rarely simple. There's always another angle, another layer, another point of view. And in my work, I've tried to understand hybrid resonators, but respect our complexity. Looking at it from a different angle, with different theories, using different experimental techniques. And I like to think that each has made a unique contribution to the final results. Likewise, I am deeply grateful to the many people who have also made this unique, unique contributions uh, to my PhD. And one I must thank in particular, and that is my supervisor, Femius Kunderink. Famous, I am your second student to receive this prize, which is a remarkable achievement on your part. Thank you for all that you've taught me. Thank you for the way you run your group, with discipline, but also with humor. And for teaching me the value of a well-conducted experiment, no matter the outcome. This prize is as much a recognition of my work as, as, as it is of your quality as a supervisor. Thank you all. Then we, move, then we move on to the uh, third prize winner of this evening, which is for the NWO Valorization uh, Prize, which this year was handed out to Professor Ron Heren of Maastricht University. Can I invite you on stage, please? <laughs> and as is traditional, again, we have a video. Molecular imaging is molecular photography. We are creating better pictures to improve the diagnostics for our medical colleagues. We are literally giving new tools to the medics. My name is Ron Heren. I'm a distinguished university professor at the Maastricht University and the director of the Maastricht Multimodal Molecular Imaging Institute. This is so important to make current medicine more precise. And that's what we can do with our physical research. Physics at the basis of everything makes it so much fun to do. The future of our molecular imaging technology is really putting it into the hands of people themselves. Make it participatory. An iPhone that can actually image your diagnosis. This award is essentially a recognition for the entire team that helped me establish this infrastructure here in the Maastricht campus. Collaboration is crucial. We need to get knowledge to migrate across the boundaries of our own disciplines. And by doing that, we can actually improve the world around us by working together. Molecular imaging is great, but we want to take it to the next level. We literally want to put our molecular knowledge into the hands of the surgeon, so that when he cuts, in three seconds, he knows what he's interacting with.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Gideon. Thank you very much, NWO, for awarding this prize. So what is valorization? Valorization, to me, is creating added value with the research all of us do. And everybody here in this room should be doing this because we're funded with public money. In Maastricht, we work to translate physics into clinical diagnosis. The five-year survival rate for cancer patients, as you heard yesterday, is increasing continuously. With our physical technologies, we are improving diagnosis to make the life of cancer patients better and increase that prognosis. For patients, for their families, for medical professionals, and for researchers in the field of clinical diagnostics, we have an obligation to do this valorization work, to translate our physical technologies to the clinic. Now, one of the things that is crucial to valorization is support. And I've been lucky enough to be supported throughout my career through many organizations that hold valorization high. AMOLF, which, as we can see from tonight's podium, has a big impact on physics research in the Netherlands, with three award winners from that. I think that's the reason why NWO is now moving it across the breadth of science. Maybe AMOLF is getting too big of an impact. I don't know how. Um, NWO itself, the Maastricht University Medical Center, and, of course, the University of Maastricht, that is more and more supporting physics research, not only with our imaging technologies, but also with the gravitational wave research that will actually continue on to increase the impact of Maastricht University. But nobody works alone. I've been lucky enough to be supported by a wonderful family. Part of them are sitting over there trying to shoot my image now. Um, and I'm very grateful that all of them are here. But I have a scientific family as well. My scientific family is my research team a great bunch of amazing interdisciplinary researchers without whom I would be useless. So they are continuously helping me to make this translation of our research to actually something that makes a difference in society. They are the true heroes of valorization and we will continue to keep it paying forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Heere. Uh, with that, I would like to ask the previous two winners to come back on stage to make a group photo of the NWO prizes of this year. So please, let's welcome back on the podium Hugo Doeleman and Federica Borla. Now, it is indeed very beautiful to see that physics research across a breadth of different disciplines, uh, mechanical properties of tissues, uh, trapped light, quantum mechanical application, all these beautiful things, valorization, all come together on this stage tonight. But as you know, the evening typically ends with a lecture by a very prestigious physicist. And there's one that has been particularly in the spotlight uh, last year most notably because of his work of the Event Horizon Telescope. Now, I am, of course, talking about Professor Heino Falke, who is our evening speaker for tonight. And Professor Falke has a very distinguished career in physics. Um, he was educated in Cologne and Bonn, obtained his PhD with the highest honors there, became a, a member of Radboud University in 2003, and has since then won many prestigious prizes for his work in uh, astrophysics and radio astronomy, and he's going to give an evening lecture in just a moment. Now, if I, we can have on screen right now a picture. Um, Professor Falke, do you recognize this picture? <laughs> that is correct. So everybody has seen these pictures of the first optical picture of a black hole in uh, April of 2019. It became world news and for good reasons. It's very good that we can actually make something that started as a mathematical curiosity of the field equations of general relativity and actually turned into something optical. Um, this picture has gone all over the world and it's very beautiful. 
Now, it just so happens that this picture, as Professor Falk already pointed out, is not one of his catalog. It very much looks like it, but we decided this evening maybe to commemorate Professor Falk's work just a little bit more to have as your dessert an actual donut that looks like a black hole. So if we can zoom in just a little bit. For the people who have not had a black hole donut, there's still some left over here. Yes? So you know black holes have a tendency to eat up things. You can return the favor tonight if you want it. Um, with that, I would very much like to invite Professor Falke on stage to give the evening lecture. Please welcome Professor Falke. Ah. Oops. Yes. Well, let's see if this works. Good. Good evening, everybody. I've been here actually several times at, uh, at Feldhoven. It's actually the first time I was allowed to sit at the VIP table. Actually, I didn't even know that exists. Um, and I'm uh, invited to talk about food, as I just learned. Um, I decided to make my talk a little bit lighter than the supermassive uh, donuts that you had eaten uh, for dessert talk about uh, black holes, how to image them. And of course, this is not my image. It's an image that was made by an entire collaboration, uh, the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration. And we had a big part of this in the Netherlands and in Europe, funded by an ERC Synergy grant of 14 million Euro, uh, euros that we got uh, in uh, 20, I think it was 14, together with my colleagues Luciano Rezzola and, and uh, Michael Kramer. And that actually funded a significant fraction of the entire um, uh, instrumentation that went to the telescopes, and uh, we were able to do essentially all aspects of the data reduction uh, as well in Europe. Of course, we tried in this collaboration, because there's only one world, as you will see, <laughs> as yes, you know, uh, we tried to do this, um, uh, this experiment such that we do, did everything at least twice or three times. This is a collaboration. Uh, there's 110 members of the collaboration that uh, came to Nijmegen in October, uh, actually November 2018, uh, to, for our first uh, and uh, our first collaboration meeting after the experiment. In fact, the first collaboration meeting after we were formed. Uh, as I always say, everybody is smiling because they already knew the results then. Uh, that's where we discussed the papers, that, where we prepared everything. Um, and uh, that's a new Bestuursgebouw uh, in, uh, in Nijmegen. And you see the institutions which are involved in red, the four European institutions. Um, Radboud was sort of there for the Netherlands, uh, Bonn, Frankfurt. Uh, IRAM is a Max Planck Institute and Spanish and uh, is a Spanish French Institute. Harvard, MIT, Arizona, Chicago, uh, Perimeter and an institution in Mexico and in Asia. And a number of colleagues, particularly in, in the Netherlands, which were collaborating. And I'll just mention a few of them. The Nova Instrumentation Group in Groningen was uh, involved. Uh, the Jive Software Group in Dringelo. Uh, we had an entire calibration team consisting of, uh, uh, of, of PhD students. They went to the telescope. They wrote software. This was a fantastic team here that we had in Radboud. Uh, we had the Overall, EHD project manager that actually organized the entire project, managed it, came from the Netherlands, um, and system engineer, outreach, and so forth. Uh, we have the theory group in Amsterdam uh, and the theory group in Radboud working on the results. So I want to acknowledge all these people who've done a lot of work uh, for, this, uh, for this project. Now, of course, um, the name already tells what we set out to do, go to the event horizon. That was always this point uh, in space and time that intrigued me the most, because it set some, uh, such a fundamental limit, such a fundamental frontier uh, in, in general relativity. This is something that came out of pure mathematics, as you may know, right? So in 1915, Einstein developed, uh, formulated GR, and then Schwarzschild, essentially in the trenches of World War I, developed you know, the, the metric of space-time for point mass. And we all know this is just a mathematical trick, right? Point masses don't exist. This is something we do, but they, 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 they are not there in reality. But when you do this, you realize that this object has some strange properties. 
namely that event horizon where the escape speed uh, of a rotating body exceeds the speed of light. And since every information, every force that we have is transmitted by light, by electromagnetic forces or something that propagates with the speed of light, that means no information, no force, and nothing can actually escape uh, that event horizon. So we can look to this point, uh, we can see it, but the space inside will exist, but we cannot ever measure it. Now, of course, there are quantum physicists which say, OK, at some point, all this information will leak out again. Um, but that brings you in big trouble with some of the basic principles of general relativity. So at the edge of what are now called black holes, and at the time this uh, was, was developed, these ideas came out that didn't even know the term black hole, they didn't know the term event horizon, they didn't know what it meant. It was just some mathematics. But at this point, really, this is where you have the big conflict between you know, the macro physics of space and time and quantum physics. And I you know, don't know, who is, you know what the answer will be. I've been talking with, with some people working on quantum physics and quantum gravity for a while, and some, some of them going retiring now and telling me, you know, you know, I've worked 30 years on this question. We, have, we haven't found the answer. Maybe we need the experiments to lead the way. And the first experiment you can do is just look at this thing. Right? Look, does this event horizon exist? Now, of course, that depends on whether these objects exist with point mass, black holes, do they exist? And as I said, this was just a theoretical idea, just mathematics. Until about the 60s, um, by the time theoretically, you know, you were able to, 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 to show that black holes could form by a collapse, and the first quasars were discovered by, in fact, the Dutchman, Martin Schmidt in Caltech. Um, and what was found was a very bright light source at billions of light years away, which was not bigger than a light year because it was varying within a year. You, should, you could tell it couldn't be bigger than a light year of, you know, just because it, it needs to be causally connected. But the luminosity was more than 100 times of an entire galaxy, you know, thousands or, 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 or more billions of stars compressed into a light year, you know, the space which is between us and the most nearby star, in fact, less than that. Um, how can you make so much energy? Well, it turns out if you throw matter at a black hole, it will accelerate to almost the speed of light. Uh, and then if you want to break it to let it fall into the black hole, you have to have some kind of viscous forces or you know, some friction. And that will heat up the material and will make it shine and will release a lot of energy. And you can calculate how much that is. And you can release almost 40% of the rest mass energy uh, of matter by throwing it into a black hole. So you know, I always tell my audience that if you pour 10 buckets of water into a black hole, you can provide all of the Netherlands with energy for an entire year. In fact, all forms of energy. So, you know, you know we as Dutch are extremely rich, right? If we, you know, of course, we still have to add a black hole, but, you know, overall, we, you know, we are very well positioned uh, for the future. Then the idea was, okay, if these black holes are truly there in the past, billions of light years in the past, in the distance, they should still be around today. And so astronomers were measuring uh, nearby galaxies, looking for objects in the very center. And they were measuring uh, gas and, and stars, how they would orbit around the center. And they found massive, compact, dark objects in the 90s. That's when I started to do my PhD. Um, and so there was evidence that these dark objects would exist. And there was something else uh, that was becoming clear and that the mass of the supermassive black hole is somehow related to the size of the galaxy. If you look at the galaxy here with a disk structure uh, and then this elliptical part of this, this spherical part, turns out now we understand that this spherical part is probably made by mergers of galaxies. When galaxies go through each other, they grow this bulge part and they grow the sup central supermassive black hole. And so there are two galaxies or types of galaxies, really massive galaxies, like these elliptical galaxies with many, many galaxies which have merged, and the normal ones like our own. And if you look at the two biggest galaxies of these two classes, then you have those two galaxies, M87, 
Messier 87, which was found in, in Paris in the 19th century from downtown Paris, actually. That was still possible at the time. No light pollution. Um, that is the closest of these big ones. Uh, and then of the normal galaxies, it's about, is the Milky Way our own, the one we are sitting in? So if you want to look at you know, the biggest black holes on the sky, which appears the biggest that you know, you'd ha ever have a chance to see, these are the two galaxies you'd have to look at. And interestingly, they have something very important in the very center as well, namely light that is produced, because you have to see the perfect darkness um, against some light. You, know, you have to shine some light on black holes in order to let them see. And in fact, what you see here is this image of uh, the galaxy M87. On the left, you see an optical image. And interestingly, uh, what you see here is this, this little streak of light uh, in the very center here. Um, and that, as we know today, and you see here this radio image, and we'll later see also an image made by LOFAR uh, here in the Netherlands, is actually plasma, relativistic plasma, that shoots out from the center of the galaxy with almost the speed of light. Um, and uh, in that little streak of light here, uh, which actually is synchrotron radiation, so these are relativistic electrons, electrons again moving almost at the speed of light in a magnetic field, they produce radio emission, also optical emission. Um, and and uh, this was found already in 1918. There was an astronomer uh, in, in the US, they found this little thing in the center of the galaxy. At that time, we didn't even know that this nebula was a galaxy. Okay. Was it part of our Milky Way? Was it a galaxy? Nothing was known. And clearly they had no clue that this was a relativistic plasma jet pointing exactly at this black hole. So it's like, you know, think about it. 1915, you know, Einstein, 1916, Schwarzschild. Um, Hilbert also played an important role, as we'll later see. Uh, and then two years later, an astronomer finds this thing which says, here I am, you know, that's where I am. And it took about 50 years to find that, you know, this mathematics had actually something to do with that image that people made, and another 50 years to actually really see it in great detail. This is what I will talk about today, uh, about M87, but what it all started with was actually our own Milky Way. Uh, this is sort of an optical image of the Milky Way that you see, our galaxy. Uh, a spiral galaxy with a little bit of bulge. You see this dust, uh, which actually blocks our view. And so that made it difficult to actually really look towards the center in the optical. We can't really see where the center is in the optical. And so it took actually radio images in the 50s to actually look through uh, the dust and near infrared technologies um, in the 90s to do that. And now we're going to zoom in to the center of the Milky Way. Uh, we're switching over to near infrared images. And um, what you uh, see is that actually the central region is filled with a plethora of stars, a millions of stars within the light years in this particular case. And then you see this movie of stars taking over 16 years, and you see how the stars move. In fact, some of these stars move with 10,000 kilometers per second. And how they move? They move on an ellipse. Exactly how the planets will move around the sun, uh, these stars move around a common center. All of them move around a common center. And you can use this to actually derive how much matter has to be there. If you go around with 10,000 kilometers per second, um, at this, this very close distance, we are you know, talking here about uh, light days and light hours, um, then you have to have a mass of, which is now measured 4.1, in fact, even better measured than I write down here, 4.1 plus minus 0.03 times 10 to the 6 uh, solar masses. Four million solar masses in the center of our Milky Way. Well, I forgot to mention, actually, for M87, other measurements which are less precise give six billion solar masses in the very center. So six billion solar masses in the big galaxy and four million in this one. And for the galactic center, it's very well established. This is a radio image of a SKA, square kilometer array pathfinder uh, experiment in South Africa, which shows the center of the Milky Way, beautiful uh, detail uh, with uh, supernova explosions, uh, star forming regions, magnetic filaments which stick out of the center of the Milky Way. This thing here, Sagittarius uh, A, which is a star that exploded 40,000 years uh, ago, right? So some of our early ancestors of humans actually saw this thing, well, they didn't see it, but you know, it was exploding when they were roaming the Netherlands, I guess. Um, and if you zoom further in, 
um, then uh, we see that structure called Sagittarius A West, this spiral structure, and in the very center you see this radio emission again. Again, a radio object, a very compact object with properties very similar to what you see in other galaxies that have suspected supermassive black holes, these compact radio sources. And it had been suspected that this actually is a supermassive black hole. And in fact, when the stars were measured, they all orbit around that radio point source. And so that was very strong evidence that black holes should exist in the centers of galaxies. I, I was doing my PhD, I was trying to explain that emission. And there's something interesting, if at the time, one was measuring higher and higher frequencies. And you see how the spectrum, this is intensity uh, as a function of uh, frequency, sorry for the units, these are radio astronomy units, Janskys, this is 10 to the uh, minus 26 uh, watts per square meter per hertz, now you know. Um, and you start here at gigahertz frequencies, uh, where a cell phone is, then you go to your magnetron at a few gigahertz, and then actually at seven millimeters and 40 gigahertz-ish, you have satellite communication, and then you go to uh, hundreds of gigahertz um, uh, millimeter waves uh, that you look at. In, in Germany, actually, we call this thing the Newt scanner because it uses sort of uh, millimeter waves to actually look through your clothes and, and look at what, what's below. And we're trying to, uh, to explain that not going in detail and just give the, the pitch of it. The point was that if you look at the different frequencies, the idea was that they come from different scales of the black hole. The red, the low frequencies come from far away from the black hole. If you go to higher and higher frequencies, you would go closer and closer to the black hole. Uh, and at the highest frequencies, um, the emission suddenly started to stop. There was no emission at higher frequencies. Okay, and if you just calculate, essentially back on the envelope, what the size of this you know, region has to be that produces this radio emission, it was of the order of the event horizon. So it looks like if you go to higher and higher frequency, uh, the emission gets closer and closer, and you're approaching the event horizon, and once you, are, you, know, you, need to, you want to go even closer, it stops. Okay, so very suggestive in a way. Um, and, and I thought, well, can we not use this to actually image a black hole? Um, and then, you know, I did some, again, back on the envelope calculation and the talking with people, and they said, oh, no, it's too small, right? So even, even if you build a very big telescope, it's, it's, just, it's just a bit too small. But there was one thing I, I, was, I forgot, and that is, of course, black holes modify space-time and the way light is bent. And in fact, turns out black holes amplify themselves. They magnify themselves. They make themselves look bigger than, uh, than they actually are. And so that's what you see illustrated here, sort of light rays, you shooting at the black hole. What happens? You know, they're being bent. And I actually, I was going, I was in the library and was looking at sort of old books, you know, some paper which actually had like, you know, I was looking at a paper which had 500 citations, that's what I was looking for, but accidentally I sort of turned a few pages further, it was a paper which was never cited again, like 20 pages, uh, 20 citations, I think. Um, and, and there I saw sort of the basics of this, uh, uh, the light bending, and that actually goes back to David Hilbert again in 1916. In a lecture in 1916, he calculated how light is bent around a black hole in the Schwarzschild metric. Quite amazing. Um, and what you see here is that there is a certain distance from uh, the, uh, like an impact parameter. If you shoot light and a parallel ray on the black, on towards a black hole, it will actually end up on a closed circle with sort of a characteristic uh, separation, which means that all light rays that are coming closer in will disappear in the event horizon. So essentially, if you look inside into a black hole you know, with light rays, then you always look into the event horizon. If you look at scales outside, uh, the emission will actually escape to infinity. Um, we were calculating that based on uh, you know, the basic model, assuming that these black holes would be engulfed by sort of optically thin radio emission. You know, I'll, I'll skip some of these details here. That's an important aspect, however. And what we found is whatever you do, you always see this dark region. So we, we were wondering how to call this. It's not a black hole because a black hole really is really the, the singularity and the deformation of space-time. So we call it the shadow of a black hole, right? It's sort of what you not see of the light uh, due to the presence of light bending and the event horizon. 
So that, that was the idea. So in this case, actually, what you not see is suddenly significant, but only if you understand, if you have light shining at it. Uh, and so you always have this, this, this shadow, um, and the prediction was sort of that you would have a ring of light surrounding it, and that simply comes from the fact that light is, you know, going ar around the circle, and, and light rays that are near the circle will go around once or half times. So most of the emission in this region will be bent towards that ring. Uh, and the inner part will be not completely dark, but it will be darkish. And the size of that shadow is always more or less within 5% of the same radius, independent of how strong the spin is, and independent of where the emission comes from, as long as it comes from within a few gravitational radii in the innermost region of, of the black hole. So this was a very clear prediction that if uh, there is a black hole, you should see that shadow. And the shadow diameter is 10 times the gravitation radius. Gravitation radius is gm over c squared, just the basic numbers of, uh, of a black hole. And that is proportional to the black hole mass. So if you know the black hole mass, you know the shadow, uh, you need to know which frequency to look at. That's astrophysics. You need to, that's uh, the understanding of the astrophysics which tells you what frequency to look at. So this was a prediction. Of course, the colors we were using uh, are fake colors, right? We're predicting radio emission, which is very, very red emission, right? Um, and you could say, of course, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's orange because, you know, uh, we're Dutch. Well, I'm sort of Dutch now. Um, and, uh, but it also the idea is that sort of, you know, it, it radiates heat and, uh, and, and, and danger. So, you know, and when I was doing radio astronomy, people had uh, rainbow colors to illustrate their, their images. You know, the color images just became available right, in, in journals. You had to pay for it. Right? It was very expensive to make color images. People were using rainbow colors, but I thought, you know, black hole is not a happy place, so rainbow colors are not, not a good thing. So, it's the, so we colored it red, okay? Um, Hollywood didn't, didn't notice, um, but I can tell you, NASA now did, so the latest you know, image of NASA, they now color their black holes red as well. So, um, of course, there's a lot of things which are wrong uh, with this image, especially the astrophysics is wrong. The light bending is right, but the astrophysics is, is, is not quite right. We have to understand how black holes work, and so a lot of work actually went into modeling uh, black holes. And so what you do is, we start with a, a big uh, supercomputer simulations, um, and uh, these are called general relativistic magnetohydrodynamic simulations, hydrodynamics, plasma flows with magnetic fields. You see here the, the, uh, the, uh, the circles are a magnetic field uh, thread, threading a, a torus, again, a donut here. We let it evolve. Uh, differential rotation will actually lead um, uh, to a stretching of the magnetic fields that will lead to a breaking of uh, part of the matter, which will actually make it fall down. So the magnetic fields are important to actually make the entire matter fall towards the center. This plasma in the black hole is ultra, ultra high vacuum, right? So this is sometimes 10 to the 5, maybe 10 to the 10 particles per cubic center, centimeter. Um, I think nobody of you can actually make that in your labs, such an ultra high vacuum, okay? Um, and so the, the molecular viscosity is, is negligible. It's the magnetic fields which play an important role here. Now we let it evolve further, um, and what you then see is that uh, uh, matter will actually fall into the black hole, and along the rotation axis, some magnetic field will be shot out like in a slingshot. That's sort of an edge effect uh, when you go from the black hole for, to, from the accretion flow to the black hole. And that is along the rotation axis, and that explains these relativistic plasma outflows that we see in, in almost everywhere where we have supermassive black holes. And so we now finally can actually simulate black holes uh, very well. Now this is density, what I showed you, but what we look at is radiation. So we have to calculate how radiation is made. And there are some uncertainties here. Uh, one uncertainty is what heats the electrons in this plasma. And there are certain prescriptions for this. Um, and we are using one that actually uh, uh, makes radiation in the jet uh, particularly visible, except in this, uh, in this simulation, which was tuned towards uh, public audiences. But it actually, it's a very detailed simulation, what you see here, um, because that is a simulation which takes into account the light bending, 
the light uh, emitting, the light absorption, uh, the, the flow in, in, uh, in, in curved space-times and the light in curved space-time, and it's 3D and it's VR. So this here is a virtual reality, general relativistic ray tracing 3D GR MHD simulation. I'm very proud of that. Spot on. It doesn't happen often that, you know, in astrophysics that we make a proper prediction, right? So, it's, uh, so this is uh, something um, to enjoy uh, also for ourselves. Now, 40 micro arc seconds, I always explain, is sort of the, the mustard seed in uh, New York that you need to resolve with a telescope. And then you can figure out how, how big a telescope has to be if you want to observe at one millimeter wavelengths. Um, the resolution of a telescope is lambda divided by d. Lambda is one millimeter. How big does d have to be to give 40 micro arc seconds? d has to be of the order of 10 thousands of, of, of kilometers. So you need to build a telescope the size of the Earth. Uh, and that's what we did. Um, in fact, it's an, it's an old technology. It's not actually a new idea. This is actually around for, uh, 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 for 30, 40 years. And when I was doing my PhD again in, in Bonn, you know, this VLBI technology, very long baseline interferometry, was developed there. And so it actually shows how important it is to be as a theorist, which I was at the time, to really un be at an experimental uh, institute to understand what is possible and what are the technologies and to extrapolate a little further, to think a little bit ahead. And so I think that close coupling between theory and experiment is important. And the idea that you have is that you combine telescope distributed all the world into one virtual telescope. Uh, because the separation, the size of a telescope gives you, uh, so the separation d determines the resolution. Yeah? You have not the sensitivity, but uh, you get the resolution. And so the first experiments were actually done in, in Europe here in, uh, in the uh, early 90s, as I said, between Spain and, and France. Uh, and then the 2000s, um, the, uh, an American triangle was formed with some European participation in uh, Hawaii, Arizona, and California. And in 2017, um, the time was ripe, the technology was good enough that we were actually making the next step towards a global consortium joining all the efforts into one big consortium. In fact, negotiations took three years. Um, started, I think, somewhere in 2014 or so to, to conclude in 2017. Um, and in 2017, we made the very first experiment with the largest array of telescopes tried at these frequencies uh, so far. Uh, it was April 5 to 11, 2017. There were eight telescopes on six different mountains. And uh, you see here Spain, uh, Arizona, California actually was closed, unfortunately. Um, uh, Hawaii, Mexico, Chile, the ALMA telescope was important. That was the key telescope, the backbone of the experiment, the most sensitive telescope. And then here at the South Pole. Um, and you need good weather. You need good weather to really uh, observe at these wavelengths. I mean, I, I was telling you, you know, uh, radio waves, you know, normal radio waves go through your body, but the millimeter waves just get stuck in your skin. So, millimeter waves absorbed in the humidity in the air. So, if you have clouds overhead, you're not going to see anything. Okay. And typically, there's bad weather somewhere in the world. Okay. And when we arrived, you know, I arrived, I think, uh, on, on, on April 4th, and we're looking at the weather forecast, and the weather was predicted to be excellent all over the world. Right? And so we're just nervous, does all the technology work? You know, because usually something goes wrong then with the telescopes, right? You have perfect weather and then telescope breaks. That also happens. But it worked. The first three days and nights worked. We were actually observing day and night, more or less, and were then very, very tired. Um, decided it was bad weather and had two days of rest. And then uh, kept on observing. We had six wonderful observing nights. Uh, that hadn't happened in the 10 years before. Uh, may not never happen again <laughs> in the next 10 years, who knows? We recorded four petabytes of data, um, and there were only minor technical hiccups. This is actually a, uh, uh, the installation at, uh, in Spain, where I was. So I'm shaking there. It's not the alcohol I'm shaking. It's just my, I don't know. Uh, um, uh, and what you see here is hard drives, massive amounts of hard drives. Um, each of these boxes has eight uh, hard drives of six terabytes each, now eight terabytes. We were, we were recording 32 gigabits per second, now 64 gigabits per second uh, for a couple of hours, in fact, days. Uh, we have some digital equipment 
which uh, uh, some down converting from the you know the, the high frequencies of the telescope to the zero to two gigahertz band of the digitizers. We had an atomic clock which was time stamping uh, the data, so we could later combine it uh, as an interferometer. Uh, and we actually store the radio waves. We store digital copies of the radio waves, and that's possible because these are uh, every uh, the quantum phase cell is so sort of populated by many many photons. So we can really record phase and amplitude of these photons. Uh, we can make multiple copies and so forth. So that's really really nice. There's some pictures of these telescopes. This here is in Mexico. In fact, all, at all these telescopes except South Pole was a representative from our team, one a student or a postdoc that went there here in Mexico, uh, Hawaii, the Remo was there, Arizona, uh, Sarah Isaun was there, actually took con completely control of, of, of the telescope, wonderful. Um, here is the Chile, South Pole, and that's you know, Spain, where, where I was. It, it always say that I you know, went there because they have the best food, which actually is true. Um, uh, they, they cook for you Andalusian food, so wonderful. You know, here in Arizona, you have to bring your deep-fried pizza, so, you know, that's where the students have to go. Um, <laughs> actually, I went there the years before, so, you know, it was okay. Then I realized that Sarah took over. I wasn't necessary anymore, so I said, okay, do it your own. Um, you know, that was stressful. This was the team, you know, here uh, with Chiaco from, from Nijmegen and, and, and uh, before the observation, this was a team after the observation, so here the sort of, we had a photo contest actually. Um, this is how the observation uh, took place. This is actually a web display that uh, we made in, 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 in Nijmegen. Uh, you see the source actually moving over the Earth, actually Earth rotating underneath the source. And we are switching between three sources, 3C273, 3C279, and M87. And these three C sources are actually the two first quasars ever found. So the source that Martin Schmidt found is the one that we're still observing and using as a calibrator source. And in fact, all the calibration later was done first on these calibrator sources before we actually applied it to the target source to not bias ourselves by what we wanted to find. So we first you know, tried everything on these calibrators before we even touched uh, M87. And then, of course, you have to turn that into images. And, uh, and so we have lots of connections, virtual baselines between telescopes. And as I said, um, what we essentially do, we record the radio waves, we bring them to interference. It's like a double-slit experiment. And depending on from which direction the emission comes, um, and how extended the source is, that changes the level of interference between these, at these two point sources. Uh, now, a very extended source, uh, for example, will create a lot of emission coming from all different directions, and they will not interfere perfectly. If you have a point source, it will be 100% uh, interference and 100% interference pattern. So that tells you, for a given separation, something about the size and also about the location uh, where the interference patterns are. So from one baseline, you get an uh, interference pattern like this, which tells you something about the size in one particular direction. But then the Earth rotates, the pr baselines are projected and deprojected, change lengths, so to speak, and then you, know, you add these uh, interference uh, patterns, and then you can reconstruct uh, the actual image uh, to some degree, which in this case you clearly see is a teapot. Okay. So this was just, you know, to show that Russell's teapot can be observed after all, to those of you who know what that is. Um, it's not perfect, and it requires, um, you can do a little better with image processing, that's something you need to do. This is something that we did, uh, we did also for M87. Uh, and uh, I'll show you in a, in, in a moment briefly how we did it, you know, what, what you know, some of the, the, the principles behind it. But let me first show you the image. And, I, and of course, when we saw that, I, I saw the first image in June 1916. And I was literally hovering above the ground for about one hour, right? So I don't know how that's physically possible, but it was really amazing. Um, but at the same time, you realize it takes a couple of, you know, it, it will still take, you know, three quarters of a year to it, it reassure yourself you're doing the right thing. Because that was looking so much like what we were looking for all the time. Uh, that's the most dangerous thing in science, right? So that make, made me extremely nervous. So after the one hour, I was just collapsing on the ground and said, oh gosh, this will be tough. But, you know, we did, we made that image, and we presented that image in, in April uh, last year, April 10. And uh, the question was, how do we do this? Uh, question, you know, do we do this all under one, you know, as one collaboration? 
in Washington under American leadership, or do we uh, do this, you know, as we operate like uh, around the world? And so we had two big uh, press conferences in Washington and in Brussels, uh, and also some others in, in other country, uh, countries like Chile and Japan and Taiwan. And I think that really reflected the, uh, the global aspect of this, uh, of this collaboration. We're, this was sort of the, the Brussels uh, press conference, and we're, this was actually the first uh, science, fundamental science press conference that took place in the Brussels EC headquarters. This actually is the press room where all the Brexit uh, uh, press conferences were. In fact, at the same, we kicked out Brexit. You know, Theresa May and all other, Angela Merkel were coming three years later, and they had to go to another room because we were there. Um, and, uh, and we had agreed that seven minutes after three, the image would be revealed. And everybody was expecting that this would be the Galactic Center image, right? And so I was, you know, I was showing that image and was secretly smiling a little bit because, you know, I, I was thinking that a lot of half the science writers will say, shoot, I have to rewrite my story now because uh, it was a different, at least a different source. And I'll take you now to this Zoom that we made to, together with ESO. And I hope the, the sound will play, because my, my son made it. I always stress that, because he's making film music. Um, yes. And so this is a zoom with a factor of one billion, if you imagine that. Going, looking towards uh, the Virgo cluster, the constellation of Virgo. The first thing you'll see to it appear is actually the loafer image made here in, uh, in the Netherlands. You see this big bubble of glass, gas which is actually blown out by this, by this plasma jet. And you see this streak of light that there is, and there always was, and we now follow it closer and closer by going to higher and higher radio frequencies. We see jet and jet, until we go to one millimeter and see that. And that's what we saw, right? It looks completely different, like everything we had ever seen before. Uh, it doesn't look like a jet anymore. It, you see that ring, you see that donut, uh, you want to bite into it and eat it. No, sorry. Um, <laughs> and uh, it, it has that asymmetry on one side, which actually comes from relativistic beaming, we think, at least in the prediction. It comes because one, you know, the, the stuff will rotate. It's a little bit inclined, so one side will rotate towards you, and that will focus, if it rotates with the speed of light, the emission into a cone in the forward direction and make it brighter. And so the, the lower part will be amplified by that beaming effect, the upper part will be de-amplified. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that, I mean, this is at the edge of resolution. People say, you know, it's just a fuzzy donut, but to us it really meant the world, so to speak, um, because you see that darkness. I mean, if you picture it, you're really looking into, you know, look, you're going around, you're looking into that stupid black hole, you see it, finally. Uh, and that's so, you know, amazing. Um, which others thought, apparently, too, I mean, these are, you know, some... Uh, head, uh, headlines really around the world. Um, there were estimates, by two independent estimates, that this image was seen by four and a half billion people, uh, which was uh, again quite amazing because it, you know, it captured more than just science. Somehow it resonates with people. You know, it, you know, science is always fascinating, but some things suddenly capture imaginations, and that's happened here, as you can tell. So this is uh, sort of uh, all kinds of donuts. Uh, what Brexit looks like from space, very right, yeah, that's very completely. Um, there were also, I mean, we also, we also had lots of positive, also other recognitions, you know, with science breakthrough of the year, uh, fun, the, the, the breakthrough prize for fundamental physics 2020, and Shep Dolman, myself, will collect the Einstein Medal in 2020 for the collaboration uh, in May. But I think the most important reward we got is that actually the Rijksmuseum now includes that picture in their collection, in their photo collection. So I think you know, this is, you know, that's a, the, I think, the maximum um, reward you can have as a scientist that you, <laughs> you get into the Rijksmuseum. Um, now, in, in order to get there, and I'll, I'll try to cut this short because I'm already running out of time a little bit. Um, we were, it was clear we, we could do this experiment only once, okay? So the first thing we did, we did not touch M87 data until, we, as I said, we did this calibration. We actually had two independent calibration pipelines, one, you know, actually developed in Nijmegen, the other one uh, at Harvard-MIT. We compared them uh, many, many times, 
six, seven data issues review, people worked extremely hard to compare all the data before we even imaged it. Um, and then when we thought it's okay, fine, we gave the calibrated data, which was still uh, not the final calibration, but good enough calibrated to four independent teams. Those teams imaged this data independently of each other. They were not allowed to talk to each other. They submitted it, and then it was compared. And all four actually found a ring. Then we scripted the imaging once more. We selected, we had selected three algorithms, three different algorithms, different softwares um, that were tested on image challenges, on different, like uh, uh, double sources, rings, disks, snowmen, no teapots, but snowmen were definitely involved uh, in, in the image testing, and they all had to be able to recover uh, those images properly. Right? So, you, so you're not, you can actually make uh, image processing algorithms which like to find rings, okay? We don't want to do this, and we didn't do this. And so what you see here are three the results of three different uh, software packages and algorithms. This is a clean algorithm which was around for 40 years, uh, slightly improved, of course. These are maximum entropy uh, uh, likelihood uh, regularizer methods. Um, and uh, they all three give more or less the same results. You see that there are subtle differences. Uh, for example, here it's a little brighter than here, obviously. Okay, this is a systematic error we make. Yeah, this is. Uh, I sometimes see people actually go into the final image and, and do some image processing on that. This is just you know will not. You have to go to the raw data, and there is a systematic uncertainty. It just depends on the location of the telescopes. Yeah, and you can actually test you know what happens if you take out a telescope and so forth. And then we combine those, and you get here, we had four independent days, four different days, four data sets. And four different days, we got the same result. Right? Uh, the first two days are slightly different from the last two days, because it takes about a week for the material, uh, three weeks for the material to rotate. So you expect some structural changes within, within a week, but they're not very strong, and that's actually good. So in that respect, this is sort of the... You know, we did all the tests we could to uh, as a, actually a 50 page paper just discussing the images, right? So we, at, at seven minutes past three, we also really released six pages, uh, six papers with uh, more than 250 pages of describing all the steps in the data reduction. Um, what we also did, and often is overlooked perhaps, is we did the biggest simulation effort ever done on supermassive black holes. And uh, to some degree, I think that was stimulated by our Black Hole Chem uh, uh, project as well to include this. And that turned out to be very important for the interpretation. You see here one of these simulations. Uh, you see that nice ring of light here going uh, around the black hole. And you see sort of the, that's, that's mainly jet emission that, which goes around and, uh, and looks fluffy. Um, it actually is brightest in that region here around that ring. We did that for, in fact, 60,000 different images that we calculated, as different astrophysical models. Uh, I still had to explain the data more or less, right, of course. Um, uh, different inclinations, different spin of the black hole, different accretion rates. Um, and what you see is they look different from one day to the other, but on average, they all have the shadow. Uh, the shadow is there all the time. You always see the ring. Um, and so uh, yeah, these were the different parameters we were um, uh, simulating. And then you, know, you can look which ones fit. And what you see here is one of the fitting models. And you, you know, run it through a detector simulation. We also developed one of the most, I think, uh, sophisticated detector simulations, VOBI observations. And uh, what you see, if you blur the simulations with our resolution, uh, you get that donut. Okay. Um, and, you know, of course, we'd like to see the sharper image, but uh, that will still have to wait. We can, um, uh, we can measure the image. We can measure its, its width. Um, so what is the width? What's the answer to the width uh, of that image? It's 42. It's 42 micro arc seconds. What else? Um, 42 micro arc seconds. If you turn that into a mass, uh, it's six and a half billion uh, solar masses that you need in order, and we calibrate that on the simulations, for example, get an error bar. So the largest error bar is actually the systematic error based on the astrophysical model. And actually this very nicely agrees with the measurements from stars, stellar kinematics in this, this galaxy. Six and a half billion solar masses was predicted before. 
uh, based on, on one of these methods. It's also perfectly it's circular to within 10%, which is another prediction. If you'd have a, a, a violation of the quadrupole moment, you could actually have egg-shaped black holes, right? Additional parameters, we don't see that. Um, and, uh, uh, but the most important thing is, I think, that we see the shadow the size that it is. And, and that's quite amazing if you think about it, in what, what age we live now. Um, I, I talked with some people working on GR for their entire careers, and I said we were always some, we were sort of the fringe people, right, working on GR. Because it was not, not nothing you couldn't test. And now we have gravitational waves, you know, we can see the dynamics. Um, the dynamics of black holes merging here. You see gravitational waves are being uh, produced. And we see the event horizon image on a very different mass scale. Turns out both signals are produced almost at the same scale. The gravitational waves are typically produced at the photon orbit, as is the emission uh, for our image. So we are probing really the same scales. Of course, one at 60 solar masses, the other one at 6 billion solar masses, which means that GR is scale invariant over eight orders of magnitude. Right? This is, I mean, you explain you know, the, the, an object the size of a human cell to something the size of, of Buckingham Palace uh, by just changing its mass, and you know, everything fits. It's, it's quite an amazing um, success of GR. Um, soon we can test this with three orders of magnitude. Once we can observe uh, Sagittarius A star in the center of the Milky Way, we get actually factor 1,000 with the same image. Uh, and that's a very clear prediction now, right? We put out uh, that what we have to see with Sagittarius A star. Uh, we, of course, can repeat that measurement. That's a big advantage we have with respect to gravitational waves. So our source is not gone in a millisecond, so we could check. Um, and we have independent multi-wavelength input. Uh, we, which we can improve and improve and improve over and over again. And so maybe at some point we find uh, that our ring is actually not quite fitting the predictions. And that, of course, would be the most exciting thing. It will be difficult to get even closer to a black hole because once you're inside the photon orbit, uh, you know, if you're at the photon orbit, 50% of your light will escape to infinity and 50% will go into the black hole. If you go inside, uh, your loss cone it will become larger and larger, so to speak, or essentially what the, the, the light that can escape will become smaller and smaller, if you define that, the loss cone. And that means as you go inside, almost all emission end, will end up in the event horizon and not at an observer. So there's this twilight zone between the photon orbit and the uh, horizon, which is very diff difficult to study with any method. And we'll, you know, maybe, you know, the question how close we'll ever get. We'll never get to the event horizon directly. We can look into it, but we'll never be able to, uh, uh, to touch it or you know, to study it. Just mentioned we are uh, you know, we're also simulating non-standard GR. Then I want to go to, uh, skip that, uh, to the, the future. Uh, this is actually a telescope in France, which we are equipping with our Black Hole Camp grants now to participate in the next observing run. Fortunately, the cable car was broken. Uh, so I had to take the helicopter, or they had to take me in the helicopter, which is, uh, is quite nice. Uh, it's quite an amazing sight to see this array of telescopes appear in the French Alps at 2,500 meter height. Uh, there are now 11, soon 12 uh, of these dishes of 15 meter size. They be all combined into one. It's almost the harshest conditions up there. I mean, you have strong winds, extremely cold in winter. And to be honest, when you go down there with this helicopter, it really feels like James Bond, right? So, I mean, this, this evil thing appears on the mountain somewhere. So, um, and that, that building here actually can host an entire 50-meter dish, actually two, two of them at least. So that's also quite, uh, quite amazing. In fact, the same kind of dish, uh, exactly the same type, is now standing in Chile, uh, not being used anymore. So we want to move that dish to Namibia in order to expand the array, because you know, we need a global array. The more telescopes you have, the better is your, your image. And certainly for the galactic center, we are, you know, just, if we just lose one telescope, we are totally screwed. Um, and, uh, and so we want to move it here to this uh, Table Mountain, which uh, fortunately belonged to the Max Planck Society. So uh, it was meant for telescopes, but it was bought in the 70s, and then it was still under apartheid rule, and so it never, it never happened there because, you know, as you, uh, uh, if you're my age, you know, it didn't do anything with the apartheid regime at the time. Um, but now it's actually independent government, stable government, and we're talking with them, and uh, we want to put it uh, on this mountain. 
So I'm still looking for some, as you know, I'm looking for funding, as some of you noticed that. Um, you know, one of them will be actually to put this telescope on the mountain, because we as Dutch don't really have our own telescope. You know, we are at the mercy of other, uh, of, of other countries providing telescopes. We combine that with an outreach program. What you see here in the background is a mobile planetarium that actually in the Netherlands goes to all schools to teach school children about astronomy and the night sky. And we brought this as a as test experiment uh, to Namibia, and it was a big success. Within like uh, one week, we had 1,500 uh, school children, and we now want to do 150,000 school children at, together with a local NGO, uh, which actually goes to schools anyway, and, uh, and, and you know, makes them part of this project. You, know, it's, it's, you want to make this an inclusive project. We actually do it also with the university there. And in fact, the, the planetarium now goes to uh, tomorrow or so, will fly to Namibia. You can still support it via crowdfunding uh, action if you want. Sorry for mentioning money. Um, and then last but not least, we may want to go to space. This is something we submitted to, to ESA uh, as a white paper, as a concept. And there'll be a, actually next week, we'll have in the US a, a workshop on space interferometry. Uh, the idea here is to have like three satellites in, in orbit around the Earth, slightly different orbits, so they will drift apart. Um, and, and so the separation will become bigger as they, as they orbit, uh, and, and you get all orientations. And so in the right you see all connections, which is actually the Fourier plane of people knowing this, we're actually measuring Fourier components of the image, and so this is the Fourier plane of the image, we're measuring all Fourier components with such an image, with, with such an experiment. Uh, because all separations, all orientations. Uh, and that's a very elegant way of doing it. And if you look at what you can g get in simulations, this is the galactic center in, uh, from the ground in, in, in a model. Um, this is sort of dynamic, this is sort of averaged. And this is what you can get, the resolution you can get from the ground yeah, for a particular model. Uh, this is what you can get from space. You can go to higher frequencies. Uh, you get much sharper images, and that's what you could recover. You could see the, the fine widths and everything, and then you can get, you know, percent level tests of GR uh, and test also non-standard theories. And uh, it will be more will be difficult to get better in the long-term future, but at least we can get to this level uh, uh, in in a realistic time scale. At least my grandchildren can. So let me conclude. I think uh, we've seen not the light but the shadow. Uh, which conclude the object is smaller than the photon orbit, one and a half short shot radii, and it would be more dif difficult to get any, any closer. Well, I mean, you could, but you won't be able to tell me what you've seen. Um, size, shape, fit, prediction of TR, mass is consistent with the, uh, the measurements, the shadow really is a signature of the light bending, um, and of the absorption in the event horizon, and that's something that I think is very unique and special. We have some measurements on polarization. We'll show that hopefully later this year on the magnetic fields. And we still have data on the galactic center, on Sagittarius A star, which is very interesting. And, and we're working on this, and it will come out at some undisclosed date uh, in the near or distant future. <laughs> uh, we have more images, hopefully, with more telescopes. Um, we're looking for synergies with other telescopes, with ESO and the SKA. And the good thing is Sagittarius and A-star and MA7 will stay around for, for tests for the next centuries, next generations. They can do it better and better. And that's sort of, I hope, it's just the beginning of a very... A small present okay. for your beautiful presentation of tonight. Oh, a yellow bag. <laughs> it's a yellow bag, indeed. i take this out. Okay. Now it's a... Now it's a uh, Okay, these are some, some hot socks, okay? This, 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 uh, this is Rembrandt, I guess. I feel I should ask uh, the organization to comment on the gifts. No, 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 no. <laughs> I think we should. Next yes. time I'll do it in Rembrandt socks, okay? Let's just say. No, so okay. it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an art uh, yes. present because the theme is uh, the it's, art it's of physics. As, as you can see here, yes. we have a nice banner which says the art of gravity. Right. We actually uh, took, uh, based on your picture, yes. we made a nice uh, piece of art. So yes. this is. Let, uh, let's hope at some point we have all kinds of images from all different fields next to the night watch in, uh, in the Rijksmuseum. <laughs> exactly. That'd be great. So. <laughs> that will be very good. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Falke.
And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of the official part of the evening uh, session. There is, of course, also an unofficial part uh, that consists of three parts. Uh, first of all, there's going to be a bar in uh, the back of the coding soft. Uh, secondly, there's going to be a physics disco, so everybody who feels like dancing tonight uh, feels free to join there. But in 10 minutes from now, in the Brabant Hall, there will also be a very interesting combination of music and light uh, being performed for you. That's in 10 minutes in the Brabant Hall. Now, um, the only thing left for me to do is to conclude the evening session, at least the official part of it. And I would like to thank you very much on behalf of myself and the organization committee for being here tonight. And please enjoy the rest of the conference tonight and tomorrow. Thank you.